Oh, right. This is the end. The end of history. European economy and society after World War II. We're going to hit several different topics here. Uh, here at the end of history. Making it epic. And I will tell you that while recording this podcast, I have Spider-Man 3 playing in the background. So if I get distracted by its awfulness... Uh, please excuse me, but I will go along as quickly as I can. We got a lot to cover here in this uh, podcast to close things out, so let's go ahead and get started. Now, one of the things to remember after World War One is just the the dumpster fire of an economy that Europe kind of had to go through, especially in Germany, as they faced inflation and. Uh, devaluing of the currency and a lot of problems in terms of getting their economy going as they try to pay back reparations. So at the end of World War II, or near the end, the Allies, when it was clear that they would defeat the Nazis, put through many efforts to attempt to rescue the economy so that things would be good. So they had a meeting, uh, it's called the Bretton Woods Conference, and there were 44 countries represented at this, including some of the ones uh, there you can see on the, the picture. I think this is in New Hampshire, of all places. It was somewhere very random. Or it could be somewhere totally different than New Hampshire. I don't know why I get that. But anyway, they're looking to create a financial situation that encourages the uh, free, uh, ideas of free trade and low tariffs so that the rest of the world can work together to rebuild after the war. I also established the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the World Bank uh, to provide loans to struggling countries if they need uh, a, a pick-me-up for their economy. So instead of having a world situation where the, the financial punishment was severe on the losers, I think the world powers realize that they've got to work together after uh, the war so that the worldwide economy can do well. And as we're going to see, it does, for the most part, a variety of factors go into that, including the Marshall Plan, the United States paying all things, but that's going to uh, take us to our next slide, is that the economy in the world, especially Western Europe and the United States, after World War II, does much, much better than, say, it did uh, after World War I. Which brings us to the economic miracle. Again, Western Europe is going to rebound incredibly well after the war. There were huge problems that Europe was facing. Scarcity of food, inflation, black markets. Uh, a lot of the cities lay destroyed or damaged. British debt at the end of World War II was 300% of the GDP at the time. The United States at that point uh, was at 109% of their GDP. And in fact, Britain would not pay off their debt from World War II until 2004. So you can tell the financial situations are incredibly uh, dangerous. But an economic miracle helped Europe recover in the bank. For example, the Marshall Plan, stimulating the economy through uh, the American intervention in Western and Southern Europe in order to keep communism out. Uh, the Korean War is going to build the economy back up. Uh, militarization, again, kind of pushes things along. And then there's a philosophy of economics uh, from uh, an economist that we mentioned before, John Maynard Keynes, British, philosopher, uh, British economist, who basically says that in order to get the economy going, you got to spin your way out of trouble. Uh, so you spend and borrow, get people uh, making some money, spending some money. And even though you have your debt there at the beginning, eventually you can pay off that debt because the economy is working. So a lot of governments were playing by those rules. Uh, you also had people who, after the war, uh, were willing to start over. A solid work ethic, higher demand, as, uh, as you're going to see in, say, the United States. The baby boomer population comes into play. After all the soldiers get home from war and they see their wives, babies happen. Yay! So that's going to help create more demand in the economy, which gives more um, incentive for producers to make goods. So all these things, again, help this, quote, economic miracle occur after World War II. A couple other issues with the economy after World War II. Uh, you're going to see governments, especially in Western Europe, certainly the communist states will not be doing this, but in Western Europe, 
Governments are now continuing the, the action of taking care of the people and building what is known as a welfare state. Uh, this has it takes several forms. One is the unemployment and disability insurance. You have Social Security for the elderly. Uh, you have free or subsidized health care. Uh, you have higher taxes on wealthier citizens uh, so that the governments can pay for all this. But really one thing that it does is that it reduces class tensions because think about it. Throughout history, it's always been a story of the rich getting these rights and the poor not getting them, and that creates tension. But now if the poor is taken care of by the government, they have less of a room maybe to complain about their situation. Uh, and that's actually how things played out. And you have political parties who uh, espouse these ideas of taking care of the people, like the Christian Democrats, who grew popular. Now, some would argue that you might have seen this only because these governments felt bad after World War II, that they uh, needed to pay back their citizens by taking care of them after dragging them through these world wars. That's, put, that's a possibility. But it's also um, just your general trend throughout the uh, 19th, 20th, 20th centuries of the government's playing a more active role uh, in terms of serving the people rather than the people serving the state, which we have certainly seen not only in absolutist governments, but also Soviet communism and Eastern communism. So there's your welfare state, which will not stay around, as we've seen. Uh, for example, in Britain, uh, the welfare state, after this oil crisis we'll talk about here later, is going to take that away due to government spending. Anyway, you also have a high level of immigration coming uh, into these countries. Uh, and these guest workers are coming in. For example, in France, there's a huge population of Algerians who come in. Again, Algeria, France's colony. But they're going to come in uh, and start working. You're going to see significant immigration in Great Britain from India, Pakistan, the Caribbean, and Africa. In the Netherlands, there are a high level of Indonesians who come in. West Germany, you see Turks moving in. So all really what you're seeing is that you know, in the past, we knew who the French were, we knew who the British were, but as the 20th century went along, and more and more of these immigrants come into these countries to work and eventually stay, the idea of being French totally changes. We thought about French being Catholic, we've been French being of that French ethnicity too, but now, you know, if you look at France today, France is a a very highly Muslim state. There are a lot a significant Muslim population in France. We haven't seen that before. So nationalists are absolutely going crazy saying that what has made France special may not be special anymore. So this is an issue that is still going. Uh, and this is an issue that is still developing. Is what is Europe going to look like? Uh, what's going to happen with it? Something to track. Another issue with the economy during the, particularly the 1970s, is a significant uh, oil crisis. And uh, it's going to trigger an energy crisis across the Western world. Uh, a little background here. In 1973, uh, there was a war in, uh, involving Israel and then Egypt and Syria um, over kind of territory and, you know, what is the role of Israel in the Middle East going to be against these Muslim states? Uh, the Palestinians, for instance, looking for their own national state. Uh, and the United States and Western Europe, a lot of them support Israel. Well, that's okay. Well, then you have this thing called OPEC. And OPEC is basically a cartel of countries which controls the price of oil. Well, they're kind of furious that the United States and Western Europe come in and try to uh, change the affairs of what's going on in the Middle East. So OPEC is going to raise oil prices, uh, and that's going to absolutely, maybe not cripple the economies in Western Europe and the United States, but it's sure going to put a break on the economic miracle that had been occurring. And uh, one thing leads to another. Uh, having to pay more for your oil, that's going to raise the price of gas, also limit the supply. And there's all sorts of other little things that occur from that. An economic consequence that occurs that's really bad. You never want this for your economy. And then you have your gas tanks holding you hostage, which is absolutely terrifying because gas smells bad. I don't know if you've ever smelled gas. 
But it doesn't smell very good. Really any gas for that. Anyway, sorry, I digress. You have this thing called stagflation develop. And stagflation is basically when prices go up and in unemployment goes up. Usually it's one or the other. If prices go down, then unemployment might go up. Or if prices go up, unemployment might go down. But here you have both happen for several economic reasons. Uh, and that's going to really slow things down. So prices are higher and people have less jobs. That is not a good uh, combination. So what impact does that have socially in terms of this economic crisis? Well, for the Soviet Union, this is bad because it's a struggling economy anyway. Now it costs more money to buy oil. Uh, perhaps probably a reason the Soviet Union was involved in uh, Afghanistan, but anyway, cost more money to buy oil, less money around to develop on consumer goods, and then more problems with the Soviet Union. The welfare state, yes, it does, um, it does help the people from quote devastation uh, in terms of you know that the government does provide certain things for them like health care, for instance, so they don't have to spend money on that and gas. But that spending was really putting these governments in a bind. So people like Margaret Thatcher in the 80s, Ronald Reagan too to a degree, really hammered home on this welfare state idea. And Thatcher really looked to reduce the government spending. In essence, that would reduce inflation. Uh, she would also uh, take over, the government would take over certain industries. Uh, before her time, Thatcher would sell those industries to private investors so really, what you see in the 80s are these governments really putting a check on spending. And by doing so, they take that under, uh, under wraps a little bit, and it allows the economy to really uh, revive itself under laissez-faire capitalism. So again, really major story here is that the oil crisis is going to trigger the governments deciding to lay off a little bit on the spending, cut back on the welfare state a little bit, and move on from there. Okay, now we're going to talk about society. Lots of topics here. we got science class, youth, women, and religion. And I don't know why that... I just put that meme up there because I think that's really funny. Well, well, well. <laughs> oh, uh, no, that's fun. Okay, anyway, let's move on. Okay, so... For the first time ever, ever, the idea of looking into science and scientific investigation. I mean, let's think about it. Copernicus, Galileo, what they did, that's cool. Like, oh, all right, the earth revolves around the sun. Cool. How does that affect my life? It doesn't. You may be social changes with the church, whatnot, but the science does not directly impact my life. After World War II, with the invention of the atomic bomb through the Manhattan Project, this idea of big science comes along. And what big science is, and, and what practical science, applied science is, is that the scientific inventions are now going to directly affect and impact my life. For example, radar for national defense. The British used it to detect German aircraft as they invaded in the Battle of Britain. Electronic computers are now whispers of them are starting to be created and looked into as the 60s and 70s go along. And we know how that impacts us today. Um, so again, science becoming applicable to life. The space race, we talked about that with Sputnik in 1969. The United States puts a man on the moon. Really, it kind of calms down in the mid-70s as, again, that economic crisis develops and, and countries really have less money to spend or maybe to allocate on that area of society. You also have the, what's called the brain drain, and you have a lot of Europe's best minds coming to America. Uh, you know, so really this is uh, another issue of, you know, European confidence maybe leading to a per potential unification of, it, of Europe so that it can compete against American intelligence, American scientific creativity and whatnot. It's something to look at.
In terms of class structure, basically what you need to know as the 20th century goes on is that the middle class is awesome. Uh, that is the, the class that is going to be most powerful and most influential. They do this because they have access to now higher education. Society is, quote, being leveled, uh, meaning that those opportunities that were only set out for the higher classes for so long now, anyone really can have an opportunity to become educated. Uh, anyone can have an opportunity to make something better of themselves. It really happens. And a lot of it also happens because, again, the welfare state. Now that, you know, everybody in the middle class can, they don't have to worry about paying for health care or maybe. Uh, they don't have to worry, in some cases, about paying for their housing. That they can have the chance maybe to go on a vacation. They can have a chance to buy a refrigerator. They can improve their standard of living because they have more disposable income and they can spend money on stuff that otherwise, in the past, they could not afford to get. Plus, these businesses and these uh, corporations know that the people have money to spend, so they're going to make stuff that people will want to buy. Refrigerators, dishwashers, radios, televisions, stereos, washing machines, vacuum cleaners, uh, blah, 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 blah. I mean, all this stuff uh, that they, Xboxes, iPhones, uh, Snuggies, um, George Foreman grills, uh, Angry Birds, I don't know, whatever. So you have all this stuff now. People have more money. Government's paying for more things for you. And now they can spend and make something more of yourself. Could it have happened without such a welfare state system? Who knows? But again, this is kind of what goes on. Uh, you also have it's just this idea of consumerism across Europe with this gadget revolution. Uh, leisure and recreation becomes more important because workers are now working fewer hours as there's more professionals. So soccer matches, horse races, movies, television, hobbies, travel, all this stuff becomes much more popular uh, much more evident in Europe after World War II. Now, not all was great in the world of Europe. Uh, after World War II, and when a new generation takes its place, a new generation of youth, in the late 1960s, and you see this definitely in the United States, there was a general rebellion against parents, authority figures, and basically the status quo. Uh, and industrial markets targeted the youth, and they targeted um, kind of what their needs were. So it's, it, it was very much, it, in your parents' and grandparents' generation, it was very much, uh, we're living at the center of, of attention, and you know we're going to kind of get what we can. Uh, and there were several reasons for this. One, the opposition to wars, especially in the United States and Vietnam. Marxist thinking became kind of cool, again, in Western Europe. You know, the communist way of thinking was the other way. Uh, it was the not the status quo. So maybe not so much the Stalin-Lenin style of communism, but straight up Marx. I mean, that's pretty revolutionary uh, and something that had never been really tried before. Uh, rejection of materialism. Uh, so the idea of getting stuff, which was what society was pushing. And then problems in higher education. We'll get into that here in a minute. But again, you just have to have an idea is that, you know, you kids out there with, with your hip-hop music and your rap music and your chains and whatnot, I mean, you're always looking for maybe to do something a little different than what your parents did. And, and that's really the same movement that is going to move here. You also have to consider, like, things that kind of facilitate it, like rock music. Okay, the Beatles are common, the Rolling Stones, groups like that. Uh, become very popular, uh, and it's just a different style of thing, something that the old generation had never seen. So in terms of higher education, in France in the year 1968 was significant actually because this is the same year of Prague Spring. Okay, it's the same year as Prague Spring. That's the. It's pretty bad. I'm just going to go ahead and erase that because... I have terrible handwriting. Anyway, Prague Spring, here we go. Uh, same year as that. So when the Czechoslovakians were revolting against the Soviet Union, French students were revolting against their teachers. Yes, teachers are stupid. They're evil. They're making us do homework. 
Oh, it's so sad. So they're looking for different conditions. For example, classes were overcrowded. They could not talk to their professors. Competition for grades were intense. Uh, they wanted more practical areas of study instead of like French literature. So there were a lot of bad things. So the students are going to go on strike, basically, and ask for different conditions. They're actually going to take over the university. So it's basically you all taking over Madison Central and just taking over and kicking out all the teachers and fighting with the police and blah, blah, blah. And the students are going to call for a general strike from the industrial workers. Here we go again. We see this in Britain in particular, saying that, hey, why don't you all go strike and like support us because it's tough being a student these days. We have to do homework and stuff. And it's, it's very sad. So help us out. Well, this was a big moment because if you remember 10 years before this in France, the Fourth Republic had fallen due to conflict over the Algerian uh, colonial situation. So this Fifth Republic was very, very, uh, I guess, fragile. There's the word. So people are like, oh, is the government going to fall again? All these students who are trying to throw up barricades. I can't imagine that. I mean, they're doing all this stuff. But Charles de Gaulle, the president of France, is going to send in troops to stop the students, and then he's going to give better wages to industrial workers. So basically, he cuts all the support out from the workers, from the students themselves, and shows them that he. Okay, women. Um, look at these ladies. They're excited to talk about women and women's rights. And after World War II, what we see is that women start to marry earlier. Uh, there's a sharp increase in women working for wages outside of the home and a decline in the overall birth rate. Uh, women are now using more contraception and some women are having that kind of independent streak of that it's not their role to get married and have kids. It's their role to find self-fulfillment uh, for themselves. So those are some trends that you see. In terms of specific uh, uh, specific movement, you could really say that the 60s, the 50s and 60s, sees the birth of the first uh, feminist movement, the modern feminist movement, if you will. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir and Brady Friedan are the two that are really pushing those ideas. And Again, women are really seeking uh, workplace rights. They're looking for equal pay. Um, they're looking for maternal leave and affordable daycare. You have some issues of gender and family, of rights to divorce and abortion. So again, just all these issues, they even face uh, women today. Uh, really the start of that movement coming in the 60s. And last but not least, we come back to where we started, and that is the Catholic Church. For a long time, ever since the French Revolution, the Catholic Church, you could say, was having a hard time keeping up with the rest of society. As society became more individualized and secular, the Catholic Church was really pushed out of the picture. But in 1962 to 1965, Pope John XIII uh, called the Second Vatican Council. And this was the most important council of the Catholic officials since the Council of Trent, way back right after the Reformation. And some of the issues discussed at what was called Vatican II was that now in the Catholic Mass, instead of Latin being used, the vernacular would be used. So in England, well not England because there's really no Catholic Church in England, uh, the United States, instead of Latin being said in the Mass uh, and being spoken in the liturgy, now the priest could speak in English. Okay, Same for like in France, they could speak it in French instead of Latin. In any case, uh, some other issues is that they said that other Christian groups should be respected, uh, which is a big change. Uh, the dress should be relaxed. They also acquit the Jews in Jesus' death, saying that they're not going to blame the Jewish race for Jesus' death anymore. Uh, there are things that are upheld, though, uh, at Vatican II. No women in the ministry, no birth control, celibacy is called... Uh, no birth control, meaning the Catholics are not encouraged and, and told really not to use birth control. And they upheld themselves as the one true Catholic church. Uh, 
But as we see, and as we've seen throughout the whole class, is that as time has gone on, religion has become less and less a factor uh, in Europe's conscious. At the beginning of the class, we saw a Europe dominated by the Catholic Church. Uh, you, you saw everything through the Catholic Church lens, and then starting with Martin Luther and the Reformation, you see that start to change as re religion started to be called into question, the Catholic Church's practices, which triggered the beginning of the Protestant Church. As time has gone on, a poll says in 2005, only 21% of Europeans see religion as, quote, very important. A 2004 poll saw that only 15% of Europeans attend church regularly. Um, granted, there are places in Europe where uh, Catholicism is much more in-depth. Uh, for example, in Poland, where you have higher amounts of uh, religious population. But as we've seen as this class has gone on, is that religion is less and less a factor. And it will be interesting to see as Europe develops over the 21st century just what role religion will play. Because as we know, through the course of AP Euro, it has played a huge role in the goings-on. And with that, this is the end. And I want to congratulate you for making this far and completing AP European history. And now, the test awaits us. But it has been a great ride. And there have been many highs and lows along the way. But as we look back on this journey called life, we must say that it has been a pleasure to go on this journey together. And I had something more epic planned in my mind, but it didn't come out that way. So that's it, the end. Game over. You made it. Congrats. Spider-Man 3 is still on, and it's still bad. So I guess I'll stop talking now. <laughs>